This morning, I just want to share from my heart what the Lord has been speaking to me in the recent months about the heartbeat of our relationship with Him, and that is prayer. For quite a while now, I have been experiencing this growing discontent in my heart and sensing a even greater, um, sensing the even invitation to go even deeper in my prayer life. And this has been my prayer and still is. And my prayer is that God, that you will teach me to pray and you will show me how to pray the kind of prayer that touches your heart and brings about the release of heaven's power. When I turn through the pages of the Bible, I can't help but notice the disparity between what I read and my own experience in prayer. And the more I read, the more I long to see a greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit that characterized the early church in my life. Because the same spirit that indwelt the apostles and the early church is the same spirit that resides in our hearts today. We worship the same Jesus who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And the promises that Jesus gave his disciples more than 2,000 years ago still hold true for us today because we are all children of the same Father. And Jesus has given us many promises in his word concerning prayer. And just before he went to the cross, he put his disciples aside and he told them that whoever believed in him would do the works that he had been doing and they would do even greater things than this because he was going to the Father. And this was followed by a promise that he would do whatever they asked in his name. And I'd like us to turn today to John chapter 14, verse 13 to 14. Jesus says here, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Isn't this an amazing promise that God can do anything and everything? God will do anything and everything He can do if we meet this one condition and that whatever we ask for glorifies Jesus. It is really mind-blowing, isn't it? But before we go further, maybe we should address the question of what does it really mean to pray in the name of Jesus I think many times when we end our prayer in the name of Jesus, we don't really give too much thought to what it really means to pray in the name of Jesus. But, you know, to ask in the name of Jesus is to, to pray in the name of Jesus is to ask as though Christ himself were asking. It is in keeping with who Jesus is, his nature and his character. And therefore, we ask only for what Jesus himself would ask. And this means that as his representatives on earth, doing his work, walking in step with his spirit, we seek to do only the will of the Father, just like Jesus. So simply put, to pray in the name of Jesus is to set aside our will and to pray in accordance with God's will. And now that we know its significance, I think it is good that each time when we end our prayer in the name of Jesus, it is good for us to check if our prayers in, are in alignment with the will of God. Then when we look at the second part of verse 13, Jesus says that He will grant any request in His name so that the Father may be glorified in Him. And this means that any prayer offered in his name that does not glorify Jesus, that does not glorify the Father, will not be answered. It will only be granted on condition that it is aligned with God's will. And it is interesting to note that the Apostle John, who penned these words in the Gospel of John, years later he would 
reiterate this truth when he wrote the epistle of John. And this is what he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. John says that we can expect God to answer our prayers if our prayers are in accordance with God's will. But how do we determine what God's will is so that we can pray in line with it? I think the difficulty in praying according to God's will is because His ways are not our ways. And oftentimes, we expect Him to work in a way that makes sense to us. But the truth is, there are many things in the Bible that we do not understand, right? There, there are some things that are hard to comprehend. So, John penned these thoughts, these scripture promises. Did John ever struggle with coming to terms with God's will? I would like to think that he did struggle. Who could understand why God allowed his brother, James, who is another disciple of Jesus, to be killed at the hands of King Herod while an angel, when while an angel was sent to deliver Peter from the same fate. James was the first of the disciples to be martyred for Christ. Did John ever pray for his brother's deliverance? I would imagine so, because Acts chapter 12, verse 5, tells us that the church earnestly prayed for Peter. And I'm sure, going by the same rationale, the church, including John himself, would have prayed for his brother James to be delivered. But Peter was miraculously, miraculously saved. James perished. So why did God spare Peter and not his brother James? You mean it was God's will for James to die at the wicked hands of King Herod? I think John himself would have grappled with many difficult issues. But the, the thing is this, even though he may not have fully understood the ways of God and his dealings in his life, but he chose to align himself with the truths of God's word. And he gives us this exhortation, which I read to you just now. Now, this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Aligning ourselves with God's will will no doubt go against the very grain of our understanding at times, simply because we see things from a very human perspective. We see very differently from God. We tend to see pain, hardship and suffering as something that is not good and something to be avoided. Our, de our definition of good perhaps include, exclude everything that is bad. But, you know, when you look at the cross, the Jews viewed the, the cross as a curse because it spoke of suffering, it spoke of shame, it spoke of torture. But what was viewed at the, as a curse turned out to be an instrument of salvation that God used to bring about the salvation of mankind. So what we consider bad may well turn out to be something that is good in the eyes of God. So when we come to God in prayer with our perception of how things ought to be, pain-free, minimal hardship, we are actually setting ourselves up for disappointment. Because when God doesn't answer our prayers according to how we expect Him to, we may just become disheartened and come to the conclusion that prayer doesn't work at the end of the day. And the motivation to pray, to pray wanes because, of our, because our expectations are not met. If we want to maintain an, a consistent, effectual prayer life, it would help us, first of all, to understand the purpose of prayer from the eternal perspective. If we are honest enough to admit it right, a lot of times, much of our prayers are by nature self-centered. It's about me, it's about my loved ones, it's about the things 
I care for and the people I care for. But the purpose of prayer is more than just meeting our needs and fulfilling our personal agenda. It's not just about what we care for, but it's also about what God cares for. It's not so much about our needs, but it's also about meeting God's needs and accomplishing His purposes. Maybe we might ask the question, does God really have needs? I thought He was self-sufficient. Yes, of course, He does. The question is, do we really give much thought to God's needs and His desires when we come to Him in prayer? Unless we come to terms with the truth that prayer is not just about our needs and our welfare, but it is also about meeting God and accomplishing His purposes, we don't really have much of a foundation upon which to build a prayer life. And it is no wonder that oftentimes we get disappointed and disillusioned when God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers according to our expectations and desires. Seeking God for provision, coming to Him and unloading our burdens and receiving a fresh supply of His strength is just one aspect of prayer. Our prayer is not complete without taking into consideration God's needs. And this is precisely what the Lord taught us in the model of prayer that He gave to us, the Lord's Prayer. Let's look at the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When we look at the model of prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, we will note that the order of the prayer has to do with God's glory before our wants. It is seeking God's glory before the satisfaction of our own needs. When you look at it, the first half com comprises three petitions, and this has to do with God and His kingdom. And the second half of the petitions which consists of four petitions, has to do with our needs. So, how does the Lord's Prayer, how does the model that the Lord has taught us, how does it play out? How does it work out in our lives? You know, when we come to God repeatedly seeking relief from our problems, we must also recognize the fact that God also has a need for fellowship with us. We come into His presence so often to speak to Him about our concerns. But God also has a need to be heard by us, isn't it? Right? Oftentimes, when we, after we pray, we just walk away from His presence. But we really don't give Him an opportunity to speak to us. We pray for our God to prosper our career, our business. That's our need. But God also has a need for us to be witnesses for Him in a manner in which we conduct ourselves and our business. We pray for God to bless and guide our children in their studies. We emphasize much on their education, and that is well and good. But beyond that, God also has a need for us to teach our children to prioritize their relationship with Him because when they give God His rightful place in their lives, they will definitely experience the favour and blessings of God. Sometimes without, we may not realise it, but we could actually be sending a very loud message to our children when we skip church or when we encourage them to skip church because of some seemingly more important activities. Let me pause a little while here and speak to the young people that are here. It's difficult to be a young person in today's world, right? There are so many challenges that our young people are faced with. And we empathize with you because we know you are under a huge amount of pressure 
to perform up to the expectations of your own expectations, the expectations of your parents and the expectation of others in your studies. And the last thing I want to do is to add more pressure on you by guilt tripping you into coming to church. But you know, when you are under great, tremendous stress, that's actually the time when you most need to be reminded of who God is and who you are to God. And you are very precious to God. He cares for you. He cares for your studies. He cares about your future. And He longs to reach out to you. And it is in His presence that you can be refreshed and you can be strengthened. Church provides a conducive environment for you to experience the reality of God's presence. And that is if you come with the right attitude and with an open heart to receive from Him. So, make Him the centre of all your activities and let Him help you navigate your way through the many challenges that you are faced with because He does a better job than you, than you trying to work things out your own way. And if you are able to learn now as a student how to prioritise and make space for God amidst your challenges right now, there is a greater likelihood that you will be able to cope in the future with the competing demands of work, family, and church. And that's because you have learned not to rely on your own strength or your own might, but you have learned to rely on the Holy Spirit. And God always honours those who honour Him. Scriptures assures us that our needs will be taken care of when we seek to prioritise God's needs. Matthew 6, verse 33. It's a, a, a scripture that we are very familiar with. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. And actually, more often than not, God gives us more than we need. I mean, from time to time, we hear testimonies from Faith Promise Partners, how God blessed them way beyond their expectations and their imagination when they sought to honour the pledges that they have made to God, even though they themselves had needs of their own. And God demonstrated His faithfulness by blessing them abundantly, not necessarily in the area, in just material terms, but in many other ways as well. And this is precisely what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says. And I want to read to you in the Amplified Version. Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes or dreams, according to his power that is at work in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. God is able to carry out His purpose completely and do super abundantly, more than all we ask or imagine if we align ourselves with His will and give Him the prerogative to do things His way. We will definitely see the manifestation of the power of God that is at work within us and through us. But perhaps the reason why we are not really seeing the fullness of God's power at work in our lives is because we actually don't give enough room for God to move freely and to have the liberty to work things out His way. We are too absorbed with wanting our will to be done. And we are too absorbed with having our own way. And we are too content with too little when God actually wants to do bigger things than what we desire. But unfortunately, our desire to have our own way oftentimes limits the power of the Holy Spirit in working in and through our situation. It's not that God is not sovereign. He is sovereign. But at the same time, He is also a gentleman who does not impose His will on us, but He waits for us to patiently come to the point 
when we are able to pray like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the complete laying down of the human will by our Lord Jesus. Not that this was the first time that he laid down his will. All his life, as we read through the scriptures, the gospel accounts, we find that Jesus had always submitted himself to the will of the Father. And here in his last moments, just before he went to the cross to complete the mission that his father had given him on on earth. Once again, we see our Lord completely surrendering his will to the will of the father. Luke chapter 2 verse, sorry, Luke 22 verse 39 to 44. Reading from the Amplified Version. And he came out and went as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived at a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, Pray continually that you may not fall into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me, yet not my will, but Always, yours be done. Now an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, deeply distressed and anguish, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intently, and his sweat became like drops of blood, falling down on the ground. The Gospel of Matthew recorded that three times Jesus prayed, prayed for the cup of divine wrath to be removed. And yet, each time, he concluded his prayer by submitting his will to the will of the Father. And he said, not my will, but your will be done. The Gospel writer, Luke, gives us a glimpse of the intense agony and conflict that our Lord had during the time of prayer. And I believe no one understands better than our Lord Jesus how difficult it can be for us humans to embrace the will of God. And I think no human has suffered more in embracing the will of God than the perfect, sinless Son of God who despite great anguish became obedient even to death on a cruel cross that was fit for the worst of criminals, not on account of his own wrongdoing, but because, but for our sake. He laid down his will so that his father's purpose would be accomplished. Jesus, the perfect son of God, had all his days on earth done only what he saw his father doing. And that's what John 5 verse 19 tells us. He never did anything that his father did not approve of. And would he now, at the very last moment, flinch and shut from the very thing that he had come to the world to accomplish? And by taking our sins upon himself, Jesus knew that he would have to drink the cup of divine wrath and experience the unimaginable pain of being separated from his father and the very thought of being utterly forsaken by his father was just unthinkable could not the will of god have been accomplished in another way most unfortunately no it was only through the unblemished sacrifice of the perfect sinless son of god that could bring about salvation for sinful men. And so, exercising perfect obedient trust to the Father, Jesus uttered these unfathomable words, yet not my will, but yours be done. And his prayer of surrender, not my will, but yours be done, was actually a defining moment because this was the significant turning point 
that resulted in the eternal salvation for all those who would believe in Him. And through His act of surrender, Jesus was actually showing us how we too can relinquish our will and submit to the Father's will. Prayer is not about bending God's will to get what we want. The purpose of prayer actually is to seek God's will and to align our desires with His plans and purposes for our lives. The author of Hebrews tells us that, let's read what the author of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. While Jesus was here on earth, He offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue Him from death. And God heard His prayers because of His deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience from the things He suffered. In this way, God qualified Him as a perfect high priest and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who, be, who obey him. The author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus' obedience amidst his suffering actually qualified him to be our high priest because he f- understands far better than we do what it's really like to willingly and faithfully endure the sometimes painful will of God for the sake of the eternal joy that was set before Him. And today, He is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us so that we too might willingly lay down our will in spite of the cost and sacrifice that may be involved sometimes in obeying the Lord. When you look through the Bible, all through the Bible, we see the relinquishment of the will as the way in which God works. We look at Abraham who sacrificed his only son Isaac, the son that he loved very much in obedience to God's command. Then we see the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who were thrown into the blazing furnace because they refused to bow down to the gods that King Nebuchadnezzar made. And they were prepared to lay down their lives if God did not deliver them. Then we read of James and John who left their fishing trade and their father in obedience to the call of Jesus to be his disciples. And we read of Mary submitting herself to God's will to be the choice instrument to bring forth our Lord Jesus. And you remember her her words, let it be to me according to your word. There are many more examples in the Bible. But in all of these examples, we see one thing in common. And that is, all of them laid down their will and surrendered themselves completely to the will of God, even though they knew that their decision would result in hardship, pain and suffering. And what was the outcome of them laying down their will? the outcome was that they saw a mighty manifestation of God's power at work, bringing about the fulfillment of His plans and purposes, not only for their lives, but for His kingdom. Often, we struggle with God's will because we see things, like I said just now, we see things from a very human perspective. We see the immediate, the immediate future. We see the here and now. But, God sees the beginning from the end. Revelation 1 verse 8, in Revelation 1 verse 8, He declares Himself to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher of our faith. God's will is based on eternity. He sees everything in totality, not only that which pertains to your life and my life, but he sees the fulfillment of his plans for the world in totality. We are only seeing from a microscopic point of view, isn't it? But God sees everything from a macro point of view. Our lives sometimes may be like a maze to us with a lot of sharp twists and turns, valleys and mountains, and 
that is because we have a very limited perspective of our situation. But God has a bird's eye view of the maze that we, of the maze, and um, He sees how He has all. He has it all figured out how the maze is going to fit into his overall perfect plan. And so therefore, it is important for us to recognize that your will and my will are based on a ground level, here and now perspective that doesn't take into account the full scope of reality. We only have a snapshot of reality. And our narrow perspective in prayer may not factor in other people who could be affected if God were to answer our prayers the way we want Him to. But God sees the overall big picture. He has the panoramic wide-angle lens and He knows all the ripple effects of our prayer requests and how a specific answer to our prayer could, act, could sometimes possibly adversely affect our loved ones, other people, and sometimes even people we don't know. And parents, we need to take note of this, especially when we pray for God's guidance and His blessings upon our children's future. Because quite often, whether you realize it or not, at the back of your mind, you already have some preset plans for them, or you have your own idea of how things should work out for them. You may have already expressed your plans to them or you may not have, but in prayer, you have been bringing your plans for your children and asking God to bless your plans for them. And here's one thing we need to watch out for because we can unconsciously or subconsciously impose our dreams and our unfulfilled ambitions on our children and mistake our plans for them to be God's will for their lives. Or we can be genuinely praying for God's will to be accomplished in their lives, but it is according to our way. And that may not be God's plan and purpose for them. It's your desire, your plan for them. And so, if God were to answer your prayer for your child the way you want Him to, which may not be in alignment with His will, that would mean that your child could be out of the will of God. It has often been said that the safest place to be in is to be in the will of God. And if we go by the same rationale, the most dangerous place to be in is actually to be out of the will of God. So parents, my encouragement to you is this. Surrender your will for your child to God and allow God align your plans for them with God's will and purpose for their lives. And young people, I say to you, I say the same to you too. You may have chart out your you may have your own idea of how you want to chart out your life, but that may not be God's plan for you. I'm not saying that you should not plan. It's a good thing to plan. But the important thing is to remember to align your plans with God's will and purpose for your lives. And instead of coming to God in prayer with your plans and asking God to bless your plans for your life, Surrender your will to God and pray like Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done. Let God speak to you and reveal His plans and purpose for your life. And don't detect how He should speak to you. Uh, and by laying out fleeces, it doesn't work this way. God, if this thing, if this, this, this happens, then this is your will for me. If this, 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 this does not happen, then I know it's not your will for me. Don't dictate to God how He should speak to you. Just let Him decide how He wants to speak to you. On your part, you listen and you wait patiently for Him to speak. 
He will speak to you if you are genuinely desiring to hear from Him. And if you are not sure how to hear the voice of God, you can pray and say, God, just shut out every voice that is not of you, every voice of the enemy or even my own voice and just cause your voice to be heard by me. And I'm sure God, in His great love for you, will speak to you and reveal His plans and purpose for your life when you desire to align your will with His will for you. You know, when we pray the prayer of relinquishment, not my will, but yours be done, sometimes we think that it's like a fatalist resignation, whatever will be, will be. But it's not. It's actually a genuine letting go, a release with hope because we know God's ways are better God's ways are better than our way. And it's a quiet, confident trust in the character of God and His sovereignty over all things. Why does God require us to relinquish our will before bringing something into being? I think it is partly because He wants us to let go of our tiny vision so that He can release to us the greater good the greater good that He has in store for us. But the fuller answer lies in the purposes of God in transforming us. Rel relinquishment brings about the crucifixion of our will. And the death of our will actually brings us to the place of total freedom. Freedom from self and everything else that is associated with self self-sufficiency, self-pity, self-absorption, self-exaltation, self-rejection and the like. And the thing is this, when self is dethroned, God is enthroned. And that's when He is free to do all that He wants to do. He's free, when He's free to have His way, He is more than able to carry out His purpose and super abundantly do more than all we can ask or imagine. As we read just now in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. When we look at the cross, we see that the cross is the supreme demonstration of God's glory. When was God most glorified in the life of Jesus? God was most glorified not when Jesus went around healing the sick because they will die again one day or when he went around casting demons or stealing the storm because storms can still come back again anytime. But God was most glorified when Jesus laid down his will and humbly submitted himself to the Father's will, even to death on the cross. And that one act of surrender resulted in the salvation of mankind. It resulted in our salvation. And so going by the same rationale, God is most glorified when we die to self and we allow Christ to live through us. The crucifixion of our will actually gives God the prerogative to do as He pleases in our lives and it gives room for His Holy Spirit to move the way He wants to without restriction. And when we give God the prerogative to do as He pleases and the Holy Spirit has the liberty to do all He wants, this is when we see the fulfillment of what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 says. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. I want to conclude by bringing you back to the first part of the Lord's Prayer and the doxology at the end of the prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If God can do great exploits through one life that is totally surrendered to Him, you can imagine the unimaginable power that is released 
through a body of believers who are fully yielded to Him. And this is God's intent when he, Jesus taught His disciples the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was not meant to be prayed in your prayer closet, to be prayed alone in your prayer closet. Very often, we personalize the Lord's Prayer. We pray for God's will to be done in our lives. We pray for God to provide our, my daily break, forgive my sins, lead me not into temptation, and deliver me from the evil one. It's not wrong, but it's a very narrow perspective of the Lord's Prayer. The focus is still self. But when you look at the original, in the original context of the Lord's Prayer given by our Lord Jesus, the prayer was meant to be prayed corporately by God's people when they gather together in His name. And this implies that there is a corporate responsibility on our part as believers to pray together for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So what does it mean when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? When we pray this, we are actually envisioning what the world would be like if God's kingdom is established in, within the hearts and in the lives of believers and His kingdom's influence is expanded and His glory, is, and His glory manifested throughout the earth. As we look around us, right, we see that this is far from being a reality. The world in which we are living in now is in chaos. Satan is working over time because he knows that his time will soon be up. And that's why, this is precisely why we need to unite our hearts all the more to pray that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who is going to pray if not you? If it's not me, it's not you. Who is going to pray? But well, maybe we may say, traffic is bad on Friday. I've got lots of works, uh, work demands and family responsibilities and other expectations. Wednesday morning watch is just too early. You know, there will always be a lot of legitimate buts. There will be a lot of buts. But let's face reality. Whatever happens on a global level or on a national level is going to affect our jobs, our families, our church. Whatever happens on a global level, whatever happens on a national level is going to affect our jobs, our families, our church, our nation. We don't want to wait until a crisis happens before we start praying for God's will to be done for our nation. That would be defensive praying. But God's kingdom should always be on the offensive. We must consistently and persistently pray for the works of the enemy to be destroyed and God's rule firmly and established in our nation and beyond. This is God's intent when He taught us the Lord's Prayer. And as people who are called by His name, every one of us, we all have a corporate responsibility to pray for this to come to pass. I know it's a struggle for many. In fact, it's a struggle for all of us. How to prioritize God's kingdom when I have so many needs, concerns, demands and expectations that I have to fulfill. How to take care of God's business when I have my own business to mind. And this is where we need to pray. Not my will, but your will be done. The God we serve is greater than our struggles. And the kind of prayer that touches his heart and bring about and brings about the release of heaven's power is when we pray not my will but your will be done amidst 
There are many struggles that we go through. When our individual wills are fully submitted to God and when we unite together as one to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our corporate submission to His will and the acknowledgement of His rule will usher in His power and His glory in our lives, in our church, in our nation and beyond. I would just like us for a few moments to close, just close your eyes and let the Word of God sink in. I know I have said many, many things, but just for a few moments, will you just please close your eyes? And let the Holy Spirit work in you. What is one thing that most resonates within your heart when you hear the word that was spoken? The thing that resonates most within is where God is soliciting a response from you. And what are you going to do about what He's speaking to you? In a while's time, we will be opening the altar for prayer. And if you sense the Lord working in a very particular aspect of your life, it can be more than one aspect or two, will you say to the Lord, Lord, I hear what you are speaking to me this morning and I'm coming to respond to what you are saying. And secondly, for those of you for those of you who have an area of need, perhaps you are seeking God for direction in your studies, in your future or in your job, or you're needing His provision, or perhaps a breakthrough in your work situation, in your family situation, in a relationship problem, or perhaps even deliverance from some area of bondage. We want to stand together with you in prayer and we want to unite our hearts together to believe for God's divine intervention in your situation. But as you come, can I suggest to you that you lay down your will at the altar and you say to the Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Have your way in me Have your way in my situation I give you the prerogative to do as you please in my life And that's the most powerful prayer that you can actually pray And when God answers that prayer That will be a point of weakness for you to share about His faithfulness and His goodness to you. If the worship team can just lead us in a song, we would like to just open up these altars for those of you, whether you have a need or you sense the Lord speaking to you in perhaps one or more aspects. Now is the time just respond and say Lord I hear you I'm responding to what you say to me I praise you for the answer Lord I praise you Lord for your miracle I praise you Lord for answers and oh Lord I go to walk in righteousness 
walk, Lord, I go away from this place to do what is right, what pleases you, what honors you. And Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, bless each individual, Lord. In the name of Jesus, let the anointing of your Holy Spirit be our portion today. In the name of Jesus, may the word of God that was shared this morning stir faith within our hearts for every need that, ha that is mentioned this morning, Lord. I pray and I ask you to give you praise. In Jesus' name, I thank you for every miracle. I thank you for every answer. Hallelujah. Come on, praise Him.